Hello and welcome everyone to the weekly garden hour with MU Extension. We're very happy to have you here. And as always, we're just as happy to have uh, our knowledge being shared with you by answering your questions. My name is Debbie Kelly. I'm a field specialist in horticulture. I'm located in Jefferson County, just south of St. Louis. We have a full team on board today. They're going to be answering your questions. We have Jennifer Shooter up in Kirksville. Kelly McGowan is in Springfield. Donna Oftenberg is in Cape Girardeau. Minos Chadri is up in the northwestern part of the state. Katie Kamler's in St. Genevieve. Uh, Dr. Uh, Pong Tian is on campus. Dr. Tamara Real is in Kansas City. And then Jared is actually our guru that's behind the scenes that makes sure that all of this happens. And we're always happy to have him on board. And then we also have um, Dr. Pat Kanan, uh, our previous person who was helping with us, always called him Pat Kanan, the weatherman. And so we're always happy to have him on as well. So what we'll do is I'll just go ahead and turn it over to Pat. We'll get the weather report and then I've got another comment or two to say and we'll get started. So Pat, go ahead. Sounds good. Thank you, Debbie. And, and good afternoon, everyone. We've had a very active and stormy week here in Missouri and, and uh, the past 24 hours is no exception to that. We have another system in eastern Kansas that is slowly moving uh, eastward and through Missouri today and tomorrow it will bring us additional chances of showers and thunderstorms. But on the left are some of the COCORAZ observers. This is a network of observers we have. It's an acronym that stands for the Community Collaborative Rain, Hail and Snow Network. I am one of the um, state coordinators. And if, uh, if you're interested in, in participating, uh, I'd be more than happy to provide more information. You can shoot me an email. I'd be happy to visit with you. But these are the reports from this morning. They're 24-hour reports. You can see some healthy amounts of rain over the past 24 hours, especially across northern parts of the state, western sections, south southern sections, a little bit lighter in east central Missouri, a little, little bit of area of lighter totals in western parts of the west central parts of the state. But overall, uh, most much uh, many areas saw a half inch to one inch. There are even reports of an inch, inch and a half. Some of the heavier totals are right around the Kansas City area, up here in far northeast Missouri, and Lewis and Clark County at it around an inch and a half. But some healthy totals over the past 24 hours, and more is on the way, at least for the next couple of days, with scattered showers and thunderstorms in the forecast, uh, all the way through about Friday morning before that system moves east of us. On the right, this is radar estimates over the past week. You can see, again, some other systems that we saw. We saw some big storms last week, especially across uh, parts of East Central Missouri. There were tornadoes documented, also all over into parts of Illinois. Heavy rain and flooding were reported right here. And look around Phelps County and Marys County and over up to Franklin, Southern Gasconade, Laclede, Pulaski County, some healthy totals, anywhere from three to more than five inches in these um, Shades of red, so some big rains across much of the state. The yellows are two or more inches, and so big totals, maybe a little bit drier areas, drier in parentheses, across parts of uh, O'Carroll County, Saline, Lexington, and up into um, oh, Livingston County. But nonetheless, most of us have seen some healthy rains. We have wet soils across much of the state. May overall will likely go down as an above normal month in the precipitation category, and climatologically, May is our wettest month of the year. On the left, we've had some up and down soil temperatures. Of course, a couple of weeks ago, we had a heat wave impacting our state. So we see uh, the red line here is for mid-Missouri. It's the average soil temperature at the two inch depth. The blue line is the 22 year average over the same time frame. And you can see how above normal these soil temperatures have been the past couple of weeks. Of course, we've transitioned into a cooler period and they've actually dipped to below average over the past few days. But generally, uh, the weekly average has been in the lower 60s across the state. On the right, you can see these are from about 10 minutes ago. These are the soil temperatures across Missouri, generally running in the mid to upper 60s across the state, even some lower 70s in, in east central and southeastern Missouri. So some mild conditions in that regard for the soil temperatures. It is an unsettled pattern. I mentioned that system in eastern Kansas will be will be spiral, spiraling and moving eastward into the state today and tonight and on into tomorrow. There will be some scattered chances of showers and thunderstorms. I just noticed on the radar, 
a pretty good line developing in southwest Missouri. It's a very thin line, but nonetheless, it will provide brief periods of heavy rain as it moves through that area. Other areas, you know, we will have some dry opportunities, but that chance will exist, at least for some scattered showers and thunderstorms today, tonight, and for much of the day tomorrow, and actually into Friday morning across eastern parts of Missouri. It does look like a very nice uh, holiday weekend shaping up uh, as, as long as we get through these next couple of days of unsettled weather. Saturday and Sunday and Monday just look outright beautiful with uh, lots of sunshine, warmer conditions, even getting to above average temperatures by Memorial Day. It's going to feel like summer, hot and humid with highs in the mid to upper 80s on, on Monday, but uh, definitely some better conditions, little to no chances of precipitation. <clears throat> on Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. So it does uh, look like some nice weather on tap. I think the pick day of the week will be Saturday for lower humidities and perfect temperatures in the upper 70s and lower 80s. It will be getting, it will be feeling a little bit more humid as we go into Sunday and Monday. This is the forecast of precipitation over the next couple of days. Again, with that system moving through uh, over the next 48 hours, anywhere from about a half to one inch. Additional rainfall is forecast. Some areas might see heavier precip, especially if they're caught underneath one of those thunderstorms. Some areas might get received less, but the overall amounts will generally range between a half and one inch over the next couple of days. The forecast for next week does indicate a high likelihood of uh, uh, above average temperatures. It looks like this warm weather will return more, more like summer-like conditions with highs well into the 80s as we go into next week, cool conditions to the north and west of us. On the right, it does look like above average precipitation across much of the north central US, extending down into New Mexico. That will clip the northwestern parts of the state. They may might be a more of an unsettled pattern with some scattered showers and thunderstorms for next week. Near normal conditions and dry across much of the rest of the state. Southeast Missouri, it might be a little drier, and it's it would be nice to get a little bit dry time with these wet soils that we've been seeing for much of the month. But my last slide I do want to show is uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Yesterday, they released their hurricane, Atlantic hurricane season outlook. They are anticipating a very active hurricane season. And, you know, the remnants of hurricanes and tropical storms can affect Missouri. It, uh, there are cases, and I, the chart below here does indicate the number of systems over the past 100 plus years that have impacted our state. Just a couple of years ago, we had three remnants of tropical storms and hurricanes uh, impact Missouri. In fact, the one back in June of, of 2020 brought quite a bit of rainfall to our state. I will say that if we do get remnants of tropical systems, they can drop a lot of rainfall across Missouri. And, and, and typically, you know, the most active part of the season is toward the end of August and into September. And there could be some dry periods at, at that time of year here in Missouri. And so they can be welcome relief and bring in much needed rainfall as we go towards the end of the summer and the first part of fall. But it does look like an active season, at least according to the uh, uh, to NOAA in regard to the hurricanes and tropical storms that they are anticipating for this year. Debbie, that's pretty much a weather report. I'll hand it back over to you. Thanks so much. Thank you. We always enjoy um, having you with us, Pat. It gives us great insight as far as what to expect uh, with lots of different things with the growing of our, our, of our plants that are outdoors. And so we appreciate you being and taking the time each week to be with us. I just want to let you guys know that um, we have some questions that are listed here uh, that we've had either come in or we know is very timely for you to know. We may have a little bit of time at the end. So if you've got questions you've wanted to ask and you've not asked us, go ahead and put those in the chat box. Donna has changed her name to ask questions here. So if you'd like and you come up with a question or you think of something as we're moving along today, by all means, feel free to go ahead and go to ask questions here, drop that question in the chat box and we'll do our best to try to answer those questions uh, when we're finished with the ones we've already got set up, but we should have some time today. So what I'm gonna do now is go ahead and I'm gonna turn it over to Kelly, who's gonna be our moderator for the rest of the day. All right, thank you, Debbie. Yeah, let's go ahead and get into our topics for today. Uh, the first thing that we're gonna talk about is bacterial diseases in vegetables. Now, typically, uh, 
a majority of our vegetable diseases are fungal, but occasionally we do have bacterial diseases. I know whenever I get a, a vegetable plant in the office that has a strong smell to it, Sometimes that's my first indication it could be bacterial. Uh, but Dr. Pong Tien from our plant diagnostic clinic is going to talk to us a little bit about that today. Uh, Pong, what do you have for us? Hello, everyone. Can you guys hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you and see your presentation. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Peng Tian. I'm the lab director at, at, of MU Plant Diagnostic Clinic. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about bacterial disease of vegetable. Uh, before talking to the details about the different diseases of vegetable, I would like to introduce you to basic concepts of plant pathogen. Uh, those two concepts are symptoms and the signs. So like human being, the plant can get sick too. So if we get a flu, we may have different symptoms such as headache or uh, muscle sore, or we have uh, a runny nose. Uh, similarly, uh, the plant may react to the disease or disorder with the symptoms. So basically the symptoms signal the plant is not functioning normally and there are various terms for different symptoms, such as like chlorosis, necrosis, a leaf spot, leaf specks, leaf freckles, leaf blight. It can be sometimes really confusing. And the symptom can look similar between the uh, causal agents of uh, disease and uh, uh, some fungal pathogens and uh, bacterial pathogens can cause similar symptoms. Regarding um, the signs, it is more specific to uh, plant pathogens. Uh, they are visible structures made by the plant pathogens or the disease agents that cause the symptoms. I wanted to point out some environmental stress such as drought or chemical damage or uh, fertilizer burn. They can cause symptoms, but there's no signs. So I would like to use two examples to show you the difference between symptoms and signs. Uh, so the first one, you can see this uh, sad looking, um, um, probably peach or apple stem. Uh, so where are the symptoms? So basically the symptom, you can see that it's a uh, uh, bark splitting open and a sunken canker, and as well as those blacking uh, part of the stem. Those are the symptoms. What about the signs? So the signs are actually the little orange color a fungal fruiting body. If you zoom in, it looks like this. Each one is, is look like a, a peach fruit, I guess. So if the weather condition become favorable for this pathogen, each ball that carries maybe ten of thousand, maybe millions of spores, they're gonna burst open and start to transmit and disperse the spores to nearby trees. That's how they uh, spread from plants to plants. So now you know the symptoms are more on the plants, but the signs are more for the pathogen. Let's look at the next example. Uh, this one is probably from the pepper, uh, uh, from pepper plants. You can see the uh, symptoms are pretty noticeable. Uh, those uh, uh, leaf spots, uh, necrotic area, lesions, and edge burning, and also yellow rain. Those are all symptoms. What about the signs? The signs may be a little bit difficult because it really depends on causal agents. If it's a fungal pathogen, we may look for the fruiting body like I uh, showed you in a previous slides. But for the uh, bacterial disease, you have to use the uh, microscope to look at um, the, uh, the symptoms for bacterial cells, which are oozing out from the edge of the leaves. Those bacteria streaming are the signs for bacterial disease. Regarding bacterial disease, uh, there are several different types of bacteria disease that can affect um, the uh, vegetables and especially crops, the leaf spots, leaf speck, and leaf fly caused by Zensomonas or Pseudomonas species, which I already showed you in the uh, previous slides, and they can uh, cause leaf uh, spots all over the leaves, and uh, they can um, cause the premature um, defoliation. They're more common in the spring when the temperature, uh, when the condition is hot, 
and warm or uh, very humid. Another two uh, bacteria disease are more associated with the rotten uh, or fruit rot uh, symptoms. Uh, one is soft rot for tomato, the other is a fruit uh, blotch of uh, uh, cucurbits. Uh, especially this disease, it is normally seed um, transmitted. So you have to use disease-free seeds or certified seeds when you plant those uh, watermelons. Another bacterial disease is black rot. This disease is very common for uh, cruciferous uh, crops. Uh, you can see the uh, lesions on the edge um, that was shown in this photo as the disease progresses, uh, those area will become bigger and bigger and cover the whole uh, leaves. And uh, if you smell the surface of this lesion, it, it, it definitely, you can smell it's rotten and it's not really ple pleasant to, to smell that. So um, this is black rot. Another very common uh, black uh, bacteria disease is fire blight for fruit trees. Uh, this is from the apple tree. It can cause shoots and buds and uh, the leaf blight uh, caused by uh, Arrhenia amylovera. I would like to also spend a, I mean, a few seconds talk about this bacteria disease called bacteria canker. It was caused by clever vector, and it can cause both the vascular discoloration and also really systemically causing the, the leaves uh, and the whole plant disease. You can see the leaf burning and lesions all over the leaf, and the, the, the plant normally died really fast. And this disease was also transmitted by the seeds. So uh, to summar, uh, summarize everything about bacteria disease for vegetable and especially crops, uh, they prefer warm and hot, humid condition. They can be uh, uh, spread by splashing water uh, or human tools, shoes, and hands. It can present in the soil and the seeds, uh, and it can be vectored by insects. The, uh, the transplants can also be another source uh, for the inoculum. To control bacteria disease, um, like uh, you have to track all the, the dispersion, uh, dispersal pattern for the disease the, uh, to you uh, for irrigation. It's better to you avoid using uh, splashing water or overhead irrigation and uh, um, uh, have good sanitation, get rid of all the disease plant as soon as possible. Because some bacteria can overwinter in the plant debris and uh, those, uh, though, uh, they can um, reinfect the plant in the next season. Uh, fungicide is not um, effective in controlling bacteria disease. You have to use bactericides. Uh, I believe, yeah, um, uh, there's a, a vegetable um, a guide for Middle West uh, a homeowner uh, or growers uh, you can refer to uh, for the uh, bactericide application recommendations. Uh, that's all I have. Uh, I would like to take any questions if there are any. All right, thank you, Pong. I don't see any questions right now, but we'll let you know if any come up. Sure, thank you. Okay, well, next, it is that time of the year. Uh, my next door neighbor has a Bradford pear tree that hangs over into my backyard and it is riddled with fire blight right now, which is very common, not just with Bradford pears, but other things as well. And Jennifer is gonna tell us a little more about it. Yes, I'd be glad to. So fire blight is common right now across the state. And it typically occurs on apples, crab apple trees, pear trees, hawthorns, pyracantha, which is also known as firethorn, and related species. And it is a bacterial disease, not a fungal disease. And the bacteria commonly overwinter in cankers, which are sunken, dark, diseased areas on your trees. The bacteria are usually spread from the cankers by insects and by wind-blown rain. And we've had a lot of that lately across the state. It's also spread by careless pruning practices. So you wanna make sure that you are cleaning your tools when you go from tree to tree. Fire blight is most severe in the spring. You're probably not gonna see this in the fall. It is a springtime disease. It occurs when soil moisture is high, bud and shoot development is rapid, and temperatures are between 60 and 75 degrees. And we've had those temperatures, we, we, you know, we've had some hot temperatures, but for the most part, it's been fairly cool. It's been in the 60 to 75 degree range. 
and we've had a lot of rain and humidity has been high. And here you see some photos of what it looks like. It has a characteristic uh, shepherd's crook here in the top photo. And the leaves will be dark and black as if they've been scorched by fire. The photos on the left show a Bradford pear that has fire blight uh, on many of its uh, branches. There's also something else wrong with this Bradford pear I'll point out, and that is it has a, a flower bed around the base, and we do not recommend doing that. Um, th this is a tree that I took in a public, took a picture of in a public area, and I don't know who put the ring of blocks around that, but we don't recommend doing that. Uh, with your trees. And then on the right, you see uh, photos of uh, fire blight infected trees. So you can see how the infection starts at the tip and goes in, it could, could be a foot to even eight, 18 inches. And it appears as if it's been scorched by fire. It has been observed to be most severe on vigorously growing trees. And for that reason, pay careful attention to the amount of fertilizer that you put on your tree, especially high nitrogen fertilizer. So you don't want to do it. More is not always better. One of the best ways to avoid fire blight is to avoid planting cultivars that are susceptible. And two of our favorite varieties of apples, Gala and Fuji, are very susceptible to fire blight. Liberty apple is one that is more resistant to fire blight and other diseases, <clears throat> excuse me. And streptomycin is a bactericide that is used to control fire blight. You can find that at garden centers or nurseries. The sprays are generally applied when wet weather occurs during bloom and temperatures are in that range I mentioned earlier, the 60 to 75 degree range. A minimum of two applications is necessary to provide control of fire blight. And you always want to read the label for specific directions and follow those um, labels exactly and always know that more is not better. Here's a photo I found of a product that you can find at some uh, local garden centers and nurseries. Not every one of them carry this product, but I actually found it here in Kirksville. And the label does say it contains streptomycin, which is the recommended uh, chemical to use to control fire blight. Also for control, you wanna prune out diseased branches. When the weather is dry, you don't wanna be pruning branches when the leaves are wet and it's a rainy day. So wait till it is hot and dry to prune out the infected areas. And you wanna cut at least eight inches below the infected branch. You also wanna dip or spray your pruning tools in a 10% bleach solution. You want to use one part bleach to nine parts water. And you want to be sure you dry your tools and oil them if needed to prevent rust. And for uh, any questions about fire blight, you can contact any of us at our uh, county extension center. That's all, Kelly. All right. Thank you, Jennifer. Okay, well, we're, we're going to talk about another disease. It's certainly that time of the year, and we've been getting some reports of rust diseases, and uh, Pong is going to tell us a little bit about that. Okay, let me share my screen. All right, okay. For rust disease of the fruit tree, this is my topic. And uh, I would like to um, give you an overview about the rust disease. Um, rust disease, that's one of my favorite disease because they are everywhere and every plant, they may get it. The soybean can have the soybean rust, corn has the corn rust, the lily, such as different type of ornamental, they have their rust. Even vegetable has rust. Uh, this is cedar apple rust. Uh, you can see this this cycle is really big. I would like to go through one by one. Uh, you may be very familiar with this rust disease because you saw that when you walk in a neighborhood or in a park. I would like to first start with the springtime, which is now. 
So during the spring time with a lot of rainfall, you may see that those spiky things showing on the, uh, on the evergreen trees, they look like this. Um, and those, uh, those big gall on the plants, uh, each hold their uh, a really long uh, horn coming out. Orange look, really sticky, and they're actually the tilia horn um, erupt from the mature uh, the galls in the spring, giving a really high, um, the high moisture or humidity level. And in each uh, horn inside it, there are, I would say, there may be millions of spores inside it, and they're called tilia spores. You can only see that through the microscope. Uh, each tilia spore will further develop into another stage called a basidian which is the fruiting structure that it can produce basidia spore, which we're showing here. Those basidia spores will fly to another host, which we call the primary host, to infect the apple or pear leaves and the fruits. And once they landed onto the leaf or the fruits, they're gonna start to penetrate into the leaf or the fruits and form another fruiting body called a pecanidia, which we're showing here. And this is the stage that, um, that is the primary stage of the season because once the pecaninia form, they can produce their own spore called a uridinia spore. And those spores can repetitively re, uh, infect the other apple or pear um, uh, fruits or leaves. And this can be repeated multiple times through the season. Entering the later in the season, they realize, whoa, the temperature is cooling down. We need to think about next year. So the fungi are going to penetrate through the leaf and form another spore, uh, structure called Asia, which is more likely showing underneath of the, uh, of the leaves. And Asia can form another spore called Asia spores. So you may not see that now, but entering the kind of like cool season, like uh, fall, you will see those, the pear leaf, if you flip it, I mean, on the surface, you will see those uh, reddish color spots or yellow spot. But if you flip leaves, you will see very interesting, I call them straw, or you can call them channel. So they basically are the easier with the full of easy spores. And each straw shoot out the spores. And those spores will not infect the apple or pear tree, they will infect an alternative host, which is cedar, or sometimes the juniper, or sometimes uh, the um, uh, evergreen tree, depends on species of the rust. And then those spores will trigger the deformation of the plant growth for the evergreen from galls. And those galls is the big reservoir of the fungus. As they, uh, and this can mature for two years. And then as in the spring, as the temperature allows, humidity allow, they will return to the cycle. So this is basically the, the life cycle for the cedar apple rust. And this is, I, I found that in my neighborhood last year, I was so surprised. I always thought that's, oh, Picanidia. When I flip it, no, it's not Picanidia, it's Asia, which is the final stage of this life cycle. So, so you can see this is really complete and busy life cycle. And you know what? There's some rust disease. The alternative host is still not being identified, making the control of this uh, rust is difficult. Uh, I, at the same time, some rust, they're more mild. They rarely cause damages or year loss to some um, crops. Now let's move on to the rust disease for uh, the uh, berries. And uh, the first disease is called orange rust. It can cause by two fungo, uh, fungi, and they normally can produce those really bright, I, I found this beautiful, <laughs> bright orange posture from the other side of the leaves in the spring when the temperature is cool and when the condition is wet. And a blackberry and a black raspberry are very susceptible and a red raspberry are less susceptible. Depends on cultivar, it may respond to the disease uh, differently. And uh, they normally don't kill the plants, and, uh, uh, but it can significantly reduce the vegetative growth and yield. Another disease, rust disease called late leaf rust. 
you can, based on the name, you can tell this more, uh, they showed up more in the later in the season. Uh, and this is another uh, fungus disease. There, uh, this disease is more severe on red respiratory and uh, again occur on the underside of the mature leaves and on the canes and on, on the fruits. Uh, you can tell the most of uh, the, the, uh, the rust, they're, they're uh, scary about the, um, about the sunshine. So they love to show up in the underside of the leaf. So when you're scouting for any disease, remember to flip the leaves to see underside, to see something uh, more de disease development. This late leaf rust occurs during the period of cool and damp weather, especially in the fall. Uh, the alternative host fortunately was identified. It is white spruce. So uh, it's better not to plant white spruce close to uh, the field of the uh, respiratory. Uh, the last uh, rust disease is called blueberry leaf rust. Uh, this is also a fungal pathogen. Uh, based on the photo, you can see that the, you can see those small yellow spots. And with the powdery look, uh, the, uh, the posture, postures and also spores coming out. And the color is really kind of bright yellow to orange. The disease occurs during the end of season and in the warm and the wet conditions. Uh, normally, it does not cause big yield loss for blueberry, especially they normally occur in the late in season and only cause some premature deflowation for the newer growth. Alternative host was identified, uh, which is hemlock trees. For disease management, use healthy and disease-free planting material, and uh, it's better to have a good air movements. Uh, you need to select a better side and with good sun, uh, uh, sun exposure. And you can also use the uh, uh, pruning tool and have good canopy and management to, to increase airflow. You can uh, thin out the canes or prune out the floricans after harvest. Since white host and weeds can harbor the disease or inoculum or pathogen, it's better to remove those, uh, those hosts and uh, plants. For orange rust, uh, remove, have good sanitation, remove all the infected plants as soon as they appear. Uh, regarding to resistance, always plant resistant variety and orange rust, uh, red raspberry will be a good option and black raspberry and blackberries are more immune to late leaf rust. Regarding for the fungicide application, previously there are very few reports about fungicide application option. Now we have some options. And, but I still would like you to tolerate leaf rust because most of the time the leaf rust will not cause, uh, cause the yield loss and fungicide are not necessary to control this disease. You can review this publication from Purdue University. Uh, it is free uh, to download. Uh, they list some fungicide to control rust, but none of them are, will cure an already infected plants. It's more I mean, I would say uh, to be applied preventatively. Uh, always think about controlling your plant disease in an integrated manner. Um, again, um, self-introduction uh, about my lab, um, MU Plant Diagnostic Clinic. Uh, uh, I would like to help you to identify any plant uh, disease or insect or uh, weeds in your lawn. Uh, feel free to contact me um, by sending an email, sending me some photos, or give me a call. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to take any question if you have any. If not, I will give you back to Kelly. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Paul. Okay, we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about sweet potatoes. Uh, Dr. Ramon Arancibia has a really interesting research project that he's been working on. Uh, to generate sweet potato slips, and he's going to tell us a little bit about that project. Ramon? Thank you, Kelly. Yeah, I'm uh, Ramon Arancivia, field specialist in horticulture in Western Tennessee uh, region. I've been working with sweet potato for a while, so it's a good opportunity to start uh, talking about sweet potatoes and the potential for uh, homeowners to grow. There, in fact, there are many that grow here in Missouri some sweet potatoes. And um, uh, can you see there? Yes. Yes. 
Okay, so is, is this is the right time to plant sweet potato if you have some slips or you can buy some slips or you can grow your own slips. A little late to grow your own slips, but you can get some slips in the market uh, right now. Um, a few things uh, about sweet potatoes uh, in general introduction is that a sweet potato is, a, is originated in South America. It is not a yam. A lot of people call it yam because it's been used that word as a marketing uh, for marketing purposes. But uh, yam is a totally different plant, uh, also tropical, but uh, the term yam is used for marketing purposes uh, and sweet potato, but it's not quite the true yam. Uh, sweet potato is a warm season crop, uh, vegetatively propagated and sensitive to chilling temperature. When we talk about chilling temperature, it's temperature below 6, 55, 60 degrees. It doesn't kill it at that, at that temperature, but the plant suffers. I grow well between 65 to 95 degrees Fahrenheit, but the optimum is usually 80, 85. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are two, type, two main types of sweet potatoes. Uh, one is the orange flesh, and the other one is the white flesh. Most of the uh, uh, consumers eat the orange flesh, but uh, white flesh is very common among Asian communities. So uh, it's uh, also a good edible prayer, but it has other uses to the white flesh. It has other uh, uses for animal consumption too, or for industry use. Uh, those are general things. So how do we uh, propagate a uh, sweet potato? As I said, it's vegetatively propagated. And in general, because it's a tropical plant that cannot handle cold temperature, it's stored in, during the overwinter in, in, a, in a store rooms at 60, 58, 60 degrees. And then the sweet potato is, a, the sweet potato is actually a root and a large root. Uh, is stored and then in the spring, early in the spring, you put them either, as you see there, you can put it in, in water or you can put it on the uh, soilless media in the greenhouse is usually done that, like that. Uh, there are some growers that uh, do this way and take each uh, tip or slip from here and put it then in a pot, several of them, 12, 6, 12 in a pot, let, the, let them grow a little bit uh, enough to be able to cut and put them in the field. So they sell these pots in, in, uh, in, the, in the store uh, 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 supply, or uh, uh, farmer supply, and they can, uh, they can uh, buy it and, and uh, cut the sleeves and plant them in the field. Yeah. What Kelly mentioned that we're doing some kind of a studies to, to for more focus to growers, but also Home gardeners, homeowners can do this. In general, this is more the traditional way to propagate uh, sweet potatoes. They, they, they put the, the sweet potatoes, as you see in this uh, left picture, in the ground. This is about 20 pounds, what you see here. Uh, in, in commercial production, they have a whole row, 1,000 or 2,000 uh, feet long, uh, three feet wide of uh, potatoes planted and covered with soil in the ground but for your consumption in this in the homeowner you want to see what how much you want you can grow those potatoes in the in the jars with water i would not recommend that because they, they can be susceptible to um, diseases and rot in the water i would prefer if you put it in a in a bucket with uh, media and as you saw previously in the in the um, uh, here in the in this uh, uh, greenhouse production, you don't have to make the bed, but you can put it in a bucket or in a small container, cover it with a uh, media, and put it in a warm uh, area for a. Uh, you can start in in April, the beginning of April. In fact, these ones here we started at the beginning of April. So we put the potatoes, we cover it with soil or compost, we cover them with plastic, and then we use a low tunnel. And this is inside the tunnel, or we can do it outside the, tunnel, the high tunnels too. Uh, this is another type of a, 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 a homemade high tunnel. And we have the plots here to uh, ready to, actually these were a uh, top with this uh, uh, the weed eater there or, or the clippers here 
we taught them to uh, make it more even when they're about 10, 12 inches. And uh, that will toughen it up a little bit before cutting them to put them in the ground. Yeah. So this is kind of the study we're doing is how early we can grow the slips and the high tunnel in comparison to the out open field or under low tunnels only. And usually under the high tunnels, you get about three to four weeks before you get the slips in the open field ready to uh, uh, cut and plant. In fact, this week we are planting and, and in the south, uh, southeast part of the state, they're planting, they planted already last week already sweet potato slips in the field coming out of the high tunnel uh, for production. But in the home, when you grow them at home, you can uh, put them and as soon as they get 12, uh, uh, 10, 12 inches, you can cut the tip to toughen it up a little bit and then put them in the field at this time of the year. Uh, so as a, as a kind of a, a summary of a, a bedding the slip uh, to produce slips uh, in, in the ground, it's usually you press sprout the potato, the sweet potato, about 80 degree, 85 degrees in a, in a container with high humidity. So it, it can start to sprout before you put them in the, in the ground. Then you put the bedding first week of April, somewhere time there, or in, the, in a container if you do it at home. Uh, to remove the plastic if you're in the field or in the tunnel. Uh, then you top, you topping by means you cut the top that, that is a very sense, a very succulent. And when you plant those, if you leave the top and you put it in the field, the shock is too high and it's gonna, that tip is going to die anyway. So we normally cut that top to make the uh, slip or the cutting tougher to go to the field. And then you cut the slips. Based on our studies, you can, if you grow them in the high tunnel with a low tunnel inside, you can harvest uh, the slips and plant them in the field uh, this time of the year, last week, for example, last week of May. Uh, if you do the high tunnel without the low tunnel inside, it's about this time of the year. But the latest one, if you do it outside in low tunnel only, you can plant them next week or they're going to be ready next week or the week after. And when it's open without cover, it can take another week to be ready to plant in the field. Uh, one thing that I want to say is a lot of people cut the slips or buy slips and uh, they keep them in the in a storage or on the shade. It's not recommended to keep them longer than one or two days. I mean, the longer you wait, the, the, the slip uses energy and it's going to have, I'm sorry. Uh, you, the cutting, the first flash of uh, roots have the highest potential to produce storage roots. You don't want to lose that first flash of roots. So you, as soon as you cut them from the bed, you put them in the ground and it's going to give you, you water them, of course, and it's going to give you the highest chance to produce uh, very good uh, storage roots. This is a, a new storage root. They still need to enlarge quite a bit uh, more but can give you a good example of a good set of roots in the ground. And usually the, the best chance or the best roots are coming right under the, the, the leaf stem there, attaching the, the stem. Uh, and those are the ones that have the highest potential uh, to produce storage roots. Or when you put them in the field, you won't have to have a well-drained, uh, preferably sandy or sandy loamy soil. Uh, fertilization depend on your a soil test. I recommend a lot of people planting flat uh, ground. I do not recommend flat ground. You want to make a rich row first and then plant them in there. Uh, especially it, it would be good if you have some kind of irrigation. Here is a one row uh, bed. Here is two rows bed. Depending on how far you want to plant this, this row. If the road is three feet apart, one row uh, planting is enough. If you have them five or six foot apart, then you can plant two rows per bed or per, per hill in, in this case. Uh, the plants can be 10, 16 inches in row spacing. 
uh, and soil, when you plant them in the field, you want to have soil about 65. And actually, Pat uh, Gina today says that the soil temperatures today uh, is uh, between 60 and 65, and the southeast uh, is over 70 degrees right now. So it's a good time to plant a sweet potato. Other ways to plant sweet potatoes in the in a home garden situation is like you see in here. Always mount because the mount can give a better air exchange with the area. What we do this uh, rich rows or mount is to promote air exchange to get into the root. Oxygen is necessary to induce production of those uh, storage roots. So it is important to plant on rich rows or mounds like you see here. And if you do a bed like this, well, using compost, compost has a good, a good porosity. So there is a good air exchange too. And you will have a good crop like you see here. And one of the things that a lot of people uh, don't know about Asian communities, they do eat the foliage, the leaves, they are edible. So you wanna give it a try, they use it as a green. So they cook it and maybe Pen can, can uh, enlighten us up, uh, about this a little more, but uh, a lot of people do eat them, uh, eat the, the, the leaves uh, as, a, as a green, cook green. Uh, I don't know if they do it uh, uh, raw, but they do for sure uh, cook. And with that, is there is any question? All right, thank you, Ramon. I don't see any questions, but that was very interesting. Thank you very much. Okay, well, next we are going to talk about our insect friends and our insect foes. And uh, Tamara, what do you have for us today? Well, you should be able to see the next insect friend or foe on your screen very soon, if not already. I'm about to launch the poll, and this is your chance to tell me, is this a friend, foe, neither, or it depends. So I'll give you guys just a, a few seconds to go ahead and vote on this one. So I'll just give you a couple more seconds, put in your votes, and then I will show you what what everybody said. So five, four, three, two, one. All right, I'm gonna stop the poll. I'm gonna share the results. And pretty overwhelmingly, we had folks say that this is a friend. So um, let's see what I said. I also said that it is a friend. So this is Svastra oblica. Um, it's also known as the sunflower bee. She is a very large bee. She's almost an inch in length. And apart from her size, if you see one of these in your garden, the first thing you're going to notice other than the size are these massive furry hind legs. To me, they kind of remind me of uh, those shaggy leg warmers that used to be in style and might be coming back. Anyway, I just think they're just absolutely fascinating. Anyway, there's another very similar looking bee in the genus Melissoides. But this one, it can be distinguished from that bee because of the flowers they prefer, the time of year that they're active. And then there are, of course, some minute traits that entomologists would be looking for, such as placements of tufts of hair. Here's another image of this bee. So unlike honeybee, honeybees, um, these are ground nesters, that as are about 70% of native bee species. They're also solitary, meaning they do not live in a colony. However, they might actually build nests close to others of the same species in large groups. These bees may even share a nest with others, uh, with others of their same species, although each bee provisions her own egg chambers. These bees do not produce honey like honeybees or bumblebees, but they do provision their offspring with pollen. So you would, if to look, when, when you might see this bee, it would be typically in late summer or even in early fall. So you still have time to put flowers in the ground so that these kinds of bees can be attracted to your garden. If you want to see these bees in your garden, then plant sunflowers, cone flowers, and other flowers in the composite uh, flower family in that Asteraceae family. You'll also want to leave some bare ground for the bees to nest in and also be very careful about pesticide usage. 
And while I have you, I do need to put out a PSA. I am starting to get calls and emails about supposed sightings of Asian giant hornet, aka the murder hornet. And I do just want to let you know that there have not been any confirmed sightings of the Asian giant hornet outside of Northwest Washington and Southern British Columbia. However, there have been many native bees and wasps that have been killed because they have been misidentified as Asian giant hornet. So please do not kill any bees or wasps unless they are a direct threat to your health or, or your home. Um, so again, here's your homework. Um, plant flowers, leave some bare earth and some pithy stems for bees to nest in so that we can create better habitat for our bees. Um, and also practice IPM. So that's integrated pest management. Make sure that you are monitoring your plants. You identify anything that may be a pest because you might be surprised. It's most likely going to be a beneficial. Only use chemicals. Those are all of the sides like uh, pesticide, insecticide, fungicide, only if it's necessary. And make sure if you do use it that you follow the label because that's the law. So thank you very much. That's what I have today. All right, thank you, Tamara. Okay, the next thing that we're going to talk about is one of my favorite flowers of all time. Let me get this pulled up. Okay, there we go. Okay, so next we are going to talk about peonies, and as you can see here, um, this is just a painting, but they're very beautiful. They're in peak bloom right now, and let's talk a little bit about them. Maybe. <laughs> Okay, peonies are a long-lived herbaceous shrub averaging about three to four feet in height and width. So you need to be mindful of that whenever you plant new plants. Uh, there is a tree peony that does, and let's go back and revisit what a herbaceous plant is. So a herbaceous plant is one that dies back to the ground every winter and then re-sprouts from the root system in the spring. So most peonies are herbaceous, meaning they will die back to the ground. But there is a tree type peony, which has a woody stem. It's more kind of like a small tree type shape. Um, when, when planting new peonies, you do want to be mindful that um, you don't want to plant the crown too deep. You don't want to plant it more than two inches deep. If you do plant it too deep, that can affect flowering. So, um, so do keep that in mind. And then one thing that I absolutely love peonies, I love all types of old fashioned flowers, is that they can actually remain undisturbed in the garden for 20 or more years without declining. And that is absolutely amazing. And I've seen them live in old homesteads for much longer than that. So that is really cool that they can stick around for that length of time. Um, if it does get to a point where they start to decline and flowering a little bit, it might be time to dig that particular clump of peonies. Um, and then you can dig and divide and share those with friends, family. So here's a picture of the crown and let me get that out of the way. Uh, here's a picture of the crown and you can kind of see the structure of kind of a bare root of a peony and the crown again, don't plant it any deeper than two inches. When digging and dividing peonies, this is what it will look like. Uh, the picture there on the right is of a clump that has been dug up out of the ground. Um, sometimes it's helpful to use a spray nozzle on a hose and get some of that excess soil off of that clump. And then you can find good places to just basically get a sharp knife and cut it up into pieces. And each of those pieces should have several of these new buds on it. And basically plant that in the ground and you'll start a whole new um, plant of peony. 
And this is a couple of photos of tree, tree peonies versus herbaceous. Herbaceous is what most people are familiar with, uh, but tree peonies can also be very beautiful. Again, they're just more of a small tree shape. Um, when it comes to fertilizer, uh, use that very sparingly. Uh, too much fertilizer, especially nitrogen, can cause poor flowering. Uh, nitrogen is mainly just for the foliar type of growth, and if too much is used, it can affect flowering. So use fertilizers very sparing, sparingly. If top growth starts to slow and overall plant vigor starts to go down, you can use just kind of a complete fertilizer that is higher in phosphorus and potassium than nitrogen. And you can kind of sprinkle that six to 18 inches away from the crown of the plant. Uh, fall is the best time to do this, but you can also do it in early spring as well. Uh, probably one of the biggest questions we get when it comes to peonies is why aren't my peonies flowering? And too much shade is the most common answer to that. Um, peonies can withstand full sun, uh, make that morning sun. They don't like hot afternoon sun, but they will uh, actually need some direct sunlight to properly flower. And then they will also do well in dappled shade as well. Uh, ants. I get a lot of questions about ants on peony blooms, and there is a, a myth that they are necessary for those blooms to open, and that is not true. Ants don't help or hinder flower buds in any way. They are simply there to feed on the sticky exudate that those buds and blooms exude. So when these when these buds and flowers start to form, they will kind of ooze out the sap like material. Ants love that and they will feed on that. So that's why you see these ants around your flowers and buds. Again, they don't help or um, hinder anything at all. They're just there to eat. Peony blooms and the rain. Well, rain is not a friend of peony blooms. And you can see what happens here. It basically beats them to death. It shortens the lifespan of the bloom and it causes them to rot after a period of time. So um, you can put some kind of coverings over your blooms if you are expecting heavy rains, uh, but this is one of the biggest enemies for peony growers. Staking, um, people often complain that their peony blooms kind of flop over on the ground, they're very heavy. There are different ways that you can stake those blooms. Um, you can buy some staking apparatuses like we see here in the picture, or you can make things yourself with, um, with like wires and things like that. But anything that you can do to get those blooms up off the ground is very helpful. And the best time to put, the, put down these types of staking apparatuses is when the plant first starts to grow in the spring. So when you first start to see some leaves above ground, go ahead and put down your, your staking of whatever you're using and then the plant can grow up through that. This is a really cool thing about peony buds. You can harvest them and store them in a refrigerator for a long period of time. And we see this pretty often in the floral industry. And basically what you do is that you cut off the buds when they're in that tight bud stage. They're just starting to show a little bit of color and they're about the consistency of a marshmallow. So they're kind of springy to the touch. Uh, that's when you want to cut your buds off of the plants. Once they're cut, make sure that they're completely dry, strip off all of the lower leaves, and then wrap them completely in clear plastic wrap, um, seal them up, and then you can wrap them in paper towel, or I'm sorry, a newspaper on top of that. Um, so after that, store them in the refrigerator. They can store there for, for several months, and then you can pull them out later and use them in bouquets. 
Once you do take them out of cold storage, you want to place them in tepid water in a cool area. And tepid water is just kind of room temperature water, not too cold, not too hot. And then once it's rehydrated, it'll bloom. Those blooms will open up and they'll last for about a week. So really cool thing that you can do with peonies, especially if you have a wedding or other event coming up. And the fun part, here's some, some beautiful peony blooms from here at the Springfield Botanical Gardens. These were taken by Patrick Byers. And you can see here just the perfection of these flowers, the, the colors, the petal shapes, um, the, the smell. I wish you could smell these. They're just absolutely incredible plants. One of my all-time favorites. And I just encourage you to um, experiment with some of these different types. And with that, Debbie, I think we're out of time and I'll go ahead and turn it back over to you. That sounds good. Um, so I will go ahead and um, close this out. And I just wanna say thank you to everyone for joining us today. I can't seem to find my PowerPoint that I had open that had all of our names on it. There it is. So let me pull that up. And next week, we'll be back again. Um, if you had questions and you didn't have an opportunity to actually uh, put that in the chat box, feel free to contact any one of us. We're listed up on the screen right here. We're happy to talk about plants. You can tell the passion that we have in how we do our presentations and the topics we bring up and the knowledge that we have. And we're always happy to share that with you. So um, have a great week and we will see you next week.